Hello, welcome to our October creation series. And this October, we are looking at science as opposed to Christianity in creation. So we're looking at, tonight, we're looking at air from a science standpoint and from a spiritual standpoint. Next week, we're looking at the web of life from a science standpoint and from a Christian standpoint. And in two and a half weeks, we are looking at air from a science standpoint, which might be uh, water law, and from a spiritual standpoint. So thank you for coming. And tonight, we have some service board participants. The first one is Sydney Everhart, and she is from North Carolina. She has a swan in uh, the University of the South, and she got a degree in biology and ecology and biodiversity in English, I believe. Is that what you told me? Yeah. She has uh, come to us and she is working at the library. So these service corps individuals have come into our community and are serving in different capacities. And Michael Finn, her partner, is here to support her. And he's from Boston, went to Clark University, and has a degree in biology. And he's working at the high school as a paraeducator. So these individuals are out in our community, and they are learning from us, and we're learning from them. And they're going to present the science piece of air. And then, and then, we have our fabulous Connie Keller, who is going to be speaking and guiding us to the spirit of the air, which she so demonstrates all the time. And everybody knows it. Um, because she lives it, breathes it, and guides us, and uh, has a website, not a website, but a connection uh, on emails that she shares that spirit of the air in the spirit of the healing. So please welcome Sydney, and she'll be first, and she'll speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then uh, Connie will come up and, and speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Good evening. Michael and I co-wrote a little script for tonight, which I'll be reading. This room generally covers air quality and Cody and like what air quality is and what air is like. So I hope you enjoy and learn something and see questions. If we're going to understand air quality, we're going to have to understand air at least a very basic level. So what exactly is air? It's a sort of chemical soup, if you will. It's 78% nitrogen, thereabouts, and about 21% oxygen, and if we're in O2, which is what we breathe in, O3, which is ozone. It's about 0.9% argon, 0.3 to 4% water vapor, and around 0.04% carbon dioxide. There are also trace amounts of neon, helium, methane, krypton, and particulate matter, such as the PM2.5, you might have heard about from mountain fires. So when we breathe in, we breathe in this mixture. Our bloodstream mainly exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide, which I'm sure you're all familiar with from maybe high school biology or something like that. 
Um, but there are still small amounts of nitrogen, for example, in our bloodstream. These small quantities of ordinary, unharmful things like nitrogen enter our bloodstream because the partial pressure of these gases is lower in our bloodstream than in the air we breathe. So, partial pressure, if you're not familiar with that term, is the tendency for gases to go from high pressure to low pressure. Um, so if you take two gases, both having some sort of pressure and combine them in the same space, that will create the total pressure and they each have a constituent of partial pressure. Makes sense. Our lungs rely on passive energy to exchange gases at the capillary level, and that means that our bodies, our cells, do not expend energy to move gases between our lung cavity and our bloodstream. So when things like partial, sorry, when things like particulate matter are small enough to pass through our tissues, they can enter our bloodstream. This is how PM 2.5, if you've heard about that from the wildfires, can get into your bloodstream, right? You breathe it in and it's so small, it goes through your tissues because your body doesn't actively filter out anything smaller than itself. So if I'm starting to lose you, you might be more familiar with divers getting the bends. So when you dive with compressed air, more nitrogen enters your bloodstream than on the surface. Um, and then when divers ascend too quickly, that decompresses their blood, and then the nitrogen comes out of their blood too quickly, which can cause an illness. So this just goes to illustrate that there are things in our blood other than oxygen and CO2, which are really all we learned about in school. Um, there's absolutely nothing to worry about when diving with best practices, just remember that. Um, and there's nothing to worry about on land when it comes to nitrogen. But like I said, this reinforces the idea that there are things other than carbon dioxide and oxygen in our bloodstream. Um, and these substances that get into our bodies through our lungs can be harmless or harmful. It just depends on you and the circumstances and whatever is in your bloodstream. So now that we're connecting with what the stuff we breathe in is on a material level, um, let's zoom out from our immediate relationship with air breathing to the atmosphere in general. Uh, we live in the troposphere, that's where the weather is, and there's also the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. These layers in the atmosphere exist because of temperature gradients uh, as you move away from sea level. While I would love to take the next 10 minutes to talk to you about the physics of why these layers exist, uh, all you really need to know for this talk is, is the very little gas exchange between the layers, right? So pretty much everything that's in the troposphere is stuck there. Um, but that also essential tracking allows for things like the water cycle and weather in general to work, right? Um, and numerous natural cycles other than the water cycle also interact with and maintain our atmosphere. Um, these include the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle. Um, and there are also complex cycles of atmospheric movement. I'm sure you've all watched enough weather in your lives to have a sense of the local cycles of atmospheric movement and also the global cycles. Um, think of the jet stream. It's these local and global climate cycles that cause some places to sit in air pollution bubbles and for wildfire smoke from the west coast to end up here and at my alma mater in Swanee, Tennessee, and even in New York City. So there are tools that exist to measure air quality and agencies that exist to regulate air pollution. So the most basic and essential tool that we have is the AQI, or the Air Quality Index. It was created by the EPA to inform the public about air safety in the 1970s. It's on a scale of 0 to 500, which rates quantities of ground level ozone, O3, PM, particulate matter, including 2.5 to 10, right, you might have heard about from the wildfires, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide. Good air quality is considered a rating of 0 to 50. Um, if you have a cell phone, I think that would be a great time to do a little group engagement. Um, pull out your phone, look at your weather app, scroll down if your app is similar to mine from Apple, and you'll probably see an air quality rating. And I bet it's at least average, and it's probably even good, right? That's the AQI. Uh, Cody's average for this year is 33. So that might make it seem like Cody is healthy, um, but that doesn't account for extremes. 
on certain days. Uh, and it also doesn't really account for the impacts of wildfires. Yeah. So the AQI was invented by the EPA in the 1970s, right? And so it is a relatively effective tool in regards to pollutants from urban settings in the 1970s. COVID 2021 isn't exactly an urban center from several decades ago, <laughs> and especially where modern forest fires are concerned. So yes, ground level ozone, particulate matter, which does come from wildfires, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide are all covered under the Clean Air Act and measured by the AQI. Pollutants um, from wildfires like large amounts of carbon dioxide, black carbon, brown carbon, and ozone precursors are not regulated. So what impacts air quality in Kobe? Well, there are anthropogenic emissions, um, those come from things like transportation and industry, and they're considered to be directly tied to human tasks, uh, but most are accurately covered under the AQI. So yes, things that we learned in the 70s that are harmful are, you know, still harmful. Like <laughs> exhaust from motor vehicles. Uh, we can talk about that another day, but you know, even though it's better now, it's still not perfect. We all know breathing carbon monoxide is just not good for you, right? Um, but wildfires are also a major player in Cody's equality. Uh, forest fires produce carbon dioxide, black carbon, ground carbon, and ozone precursors, as well as volatile and semi volatile organic material and nitrogen oxides. Volatile organic material can become particulate matter downstream in the atmosphere, right? So it can react in the atmosphere from different compounds from when it's served out. And uh, NO or nitrous oxide or nitrous oxide compounds are the molecules that react with other things in the atmosphere called acid rain, in part. Um, so, a notable danger is particulate matter 2.5. Uh, I know I've talked a lot about this, but this is one of the main particulates that we know can cause cancer in some individuals mm -hmm. that are also from forest fires. So it's 50 times smaller than your red blood cells. Um, you breathe it in, it enters your bloodstream, it causes inflammation. And so that inflammation can lead to a whole host of diseases such as asthma, COPD, and even lung cancer, depending on your individual risk. Uh, which begs the question, what causes wildfires or forest fires? Well, there are natural triggers, lightning, volcanic activity, meteors, and even coal seam fires. Um, they're not necessarily a bad thing. So they're important for serotonin species like the lodgepole pine. Um, so if you know anything about lodgepole pines, there has to be a small fire heat applied to the cones for them to open deposit seeds and grow new trees. And the killing off of some sensitive older individuals in a group called snags, which are dry dead trees. Um, are important for their succession. So it's a cycling through the population over time, assisted by fire. And this is essentially what we call fire ecology. It doesn't just happen with logical pines. It's in pretty much every ecosystem. Um, and it seriously impacts succession in almost all ecosystems. So healthy fires, as you might hear them referred to, are generally smaller. And what I mean by this is that they're ground fires, and they don't travel over large geographic regions. And this means that climate animals can survive in the crown mm -hmm. of the tree. Um, and mammals, fast running, which is charismatic, I think upon them, you've heard of them, right? Like big, interesting animals, like a deer or bison. They can usually run out of a burning area because they don't have a large geographic distribution when they're healthy. <clears throat> and then when slower individuals can escape, um, this can naturally cull populations, which means that it selects for more fit individuals and eliminate individuals that might be diseased, right? Causing healthier populations. It's worth noting that these are not crown fires. Like crown fires, so a crown fire usually kills the tree because it burns the crown on the top of the tree. And these can be detrimental for tree populations. Uh, most natural fires are frequent, they're geographically limited, and they don't burn at very high temperatures. Uh, the wildfires we see today cover large areas, they burn at very high heat, and they often become crown fires. So fires are particular, or sorry, 
fires are partially burning like this because of increased fuel loads, right? We have bigger, hotter fires because of increased fuel loads um, and changes in the climate. It's climate change. <laughs> So there are anthropogenic triggers for forest fires, campfires, regular equipment, cigarettes, intentional acts of arson, and according to the National Park Service, 85% of wildfires today are caused by anthropogenic triggers. But there are actually a couple types of anthropogenic foreign triggers. Um, control of burns and prescribed fires may make natural fires. So that means that people, and by people I mean scientists, have care carefully calculated what the weather's doing, looked at a forest, so it's going to have smaller, lower temp ground fires, right? And help the ecosystem instead of destroying it. Um, these experts are also certified, so, you know, you can feel reassured that they know what they're doing. Uh, they often do ecological thinning before burn, which means that they remove fuel loads, right? So they don't have fire ladders to go up trees and become ground fires. Um, there's also native land management. So groups of native peoples in North America and globally have been using intentional fire to manage landscape for thousands of years. The killing of indigenous people, the deprivation and loss of tradition, and the implementation of a reservation system is partially responsible for the fuel load buildup that is causing, causing catastrophic fires today. So indigenous people were burning for ceremonial uh, use in the forests and also to make forests more livable for them where they had control of the majority of the continent. Um, these were generally small, or density fires, um, and helped them often select for culturally important plants uh, and for healthy game. And to go a little bit further out on the limb here, after thousands of years of living in what we now call the United States, the native people seem to have determined, at least for fires concerned, generally what is most livable for this continent, which are frequent small fires, before most of our ancestors arrived here, and the U.S. government supported the widespread native practice of burning. Sorry, the government suppressed the widespread native practice of burning. It is integral to managing our ecosystems for livability, right? So our continent generally needs these small fires that the native peoples were managing for for thousands of years before <coughs> the U.S. government suppressed that fire management and the cultures associated with them. Um, Another reason that forest fires are becoming bigger, longer, more intense, and more devastating is because of climate change. Um, specifically, the climate change forest fire feedback loop. So basically, when you have deforestation in general, this leads to what we call cumulative deforestation, which is where you lose large amounts of trees or whole forest ecosystems over large areas. This leads to less evapotranspiration, which is where plants, especially trees, suck water from the soil up and release it into the atmosphere. It's integral to the water cycle. This leads to less rainfall, right, because we're not returning the water at the same rate to the atmosphere. This leads to increased drought, and then drought leads to more deforestation. You might want to look, look into the idea of desertification. It's an interesting area of research, and there are also very accessible books if you're not into reading things off of scientific papers. Um, it covers lots of global issues and socioeconomics that are also associated with the world becoming more desert-like, where deserts have not normally been in recorded history. Um, trees are also essential carbon sinks, so they basically lock up carbon away from the atmosphere so it doesn't contribute to the greenhouse effect um, and things related to climate change, like ocean acidif acidification, coral bleaching, polar sea ice melt, sea level rise, and the other numerous digital things caused by climate change. Um, so by burning trees, not sinking my carbon and other plants, this leads to more greenhouse gas emission, more climate change, and more desertification. Uh, a hotter fire climate overall. Forest fire air pollution also plays a role in climate change. As I mentioned earlier, forest fires release black and brown carbon. So these particular uh, pollutants absorb light and then they release heat. So they're also contributing to climate change. But forest management and reversal of climate change are our best options. We have to make forest fires more livable and improve air quality related to forest fires. Um, yeah, climate change reversal, proper monitoring, further research, regulation, 
and resource management are essentially our best tools in improving air quality on the scale of the whole country so if you're not there are ways you can protect yourself you can talk to your doctor and they can recommend an appropriate threshold for you to avoid strenuous outdoor activity or recommend how often you should change your air filters so changing your air filters can improve your indoor air quality and we each have unique thresholds based on our health for when you know you might want to check the AQI and above a certain number stay inside so you're not exposed to poor air quality KN95 and N95 masks if your doctor recommends them or another option for filtering out particulate matter masks that are not KN95 and N95 are better generally don't filter out the particles associated with air quality issues so while the AQI doesn't account for all the pollutants produced by fires it does account for PM2.5 right and so the AQI is still helpful in some regards to determining if it's safe to go outside or not or how your air quality is doing in general if you want to improve your indoor air quality you can change your air filters you can have your air ducts clean you can use cooking vents because cooking fumes are another source of indoor air pollution clean your carpets and rugs because they trap dust and particulate matter and are basically filters in and of themselves and you might even add a few house plants peace lilies, snake plant, pathos, palms, bromeliads, ivy, spider plants, and ferns are just a few options that are known or at least pointed to improving indoor air quality and they're pretty available in the market mosses are also amazing at trapping air pollution shameless plug for Michael you can find lots of interesting and creative decorative ways to add them to your home decor there are also a lot of ways that you can get involved in improving air quality the quality of air locally, globally, and for the future so if you want to get involved in the climate change advocacy group you can do that or you can just walk and sit drive maybe a few more times a week you can learn more about forest management and how you can better manage your own property and you can even encourage native ecosystem reforesting projects right, you're building back carbon sinks that you might have lost or you can do something as simple as plant a tree at your house the options are really limitless and the effort is from very simple to life absorbing I'm sorry this has been very long thank you all for listening yeah, thank you Yay! <laughs> I would be um, drummed out of the church and the scientific community if I attempted that. <laughs> I need um, my daughter Catherine with me, who was here last weekend, and she has worked as an organic chemist for the EPA for probably 30 years. And so she can talk the talk. I can um, just say I love my daughter, but I <laughs> don't talk the talk. My background is in, um, I was an English lit major in college. I read a lot of poetry, songs, essays about wind, about spirit. I, um, one of the great adventures in my life was when I did EFM, Education for Ministry, 
which I was in the, what, about 1990, we had our first group here at Cody, and um, I, got, I got very excited about Genesis. My love of, I, I've always loved the Bible. I grew up in a home where we loved the Bible. My father was an Episcopal priest. We were storytelling people at our house. The Bible for me is storytelling, wonderful storytelling. And um, I had always been more of a New Testament person. That's where my interest had been until I took EFM and discovered the wonder of Genesis. And Genesis changed a lot of my thinking, my understanding of my world. Um, it's poetry, it's theology, it's um, energizing, it forms questions, it asks questions. It's just for me, that was the great part of EFM, was discovering the power in my life of Genesis. And so I have here with me my EFM Bible. And my EFM Bible has a wonderful cover on it, made for me by our dear, dear friend, Carrie Gatch, who was part of the original EFM um, group here in Cody, and she's been dead for a long time now. An energized, exciting, um, loving person who brought, gave her life, shared her life in so many ways that enable me to be a different, stronger, better person, uh, a better mentor in EFM, and she made book covers for us, for our Bibles. And I still, I will use this until the day I die. And she um, gave it to me. And I think, Jane, you might have one. Um, I'm not sure who who all, but the, it's very powerful for me that that my Bible. I, I'm a writer in the in the. I mean, I scribble, I underline, I put in question marks, I argue, I um, identify things that are theological statements. I found it, because of EFM, I just found all different levels and new places that um, the Bible stories could take me. And this creation story was particularly powerful for me. I had always kind of um, downvalued it. And it became such a powerful thing for me that I, you know, I can look in the garden and I'm looking for Adam and Eve behind the bushes. It's, it kind of uh, gave a strength and a vision to me of what creation is. And it, um, it's made me appreciate uh, the stories in new, in new ways. I um, use colored pens. I mean, it's a mess. <laughs> if you look at my Bible and your orientation was, this is a sacred book. And I have things underlined and questions and, you know, once in a while I even said bullshit. So, <laughs> so it, it was a, it was a, that was part of the wonder for me, was that 
all of a sudden I discovered depths and, and, and powerful, powerful stories. And the stories that moved me often had wind in them, the power of the spirit to shape a body, to change directions um, for people, to inspire people, inspire, breathe in, you're breathing in the spirit, you're inspired, and the inspiration that came from um, something that at times stories I dismissed or laughed at all of a sudden became incredibly strong and wonderful for me. And so that's the spirit. I see that as the spirit. And the, and the spirit in the book uh, matches the spirit that, you, that I as an individual took to the book. I mean, you open yourself to a book and the book opens itself to you. And, and so that's part of the, the spirit for me is the wind, the power of the wind of creation. Uh, the spirit of God is what opens the world, makes it possible to ask really difficult questions um, no matter where you are or what you're doing, if you just lost the baby. And I can remember arguing with the book and um, being scared. At that point, when I lost the baby, I was living in Alaska. And I was 250 miles away from the nearest road, the nearest doctor. And what I had wonderful medicine women, they called them, spirit-filled, perhaps not what I would identify at that point as spirit, but I very strongly identify it now as spirit. And um, sitting, sitting by me, humming songs and rubbing my brow and um, ministering, loving me, and knowing that I was sad and and um, taking my sadness and helping me to uh, uh, use it. And so that, um, that's part of the story. The power of, we were on a freighter one time going from Honolulu to New York City and we went through the Panama Canal and ran into the tail end of a hurricane. And if, I mean, a ship like that is huge. You could have quite a few of these churches in the ship. And the, um, to hear the propeller whirling in the air as the ship dives down in a wave and comes up again. I mean, that's power. And, and that's power of water and power of the spirit. And so that is part of my picture of wind and, uh, and the spirit. Uh, I can remember being in, um, again, small villages, flying in very small airplanes in Alaska when it was maybe 20 degrees below zero. And the pilot, we had to sign something that gave our permission to the pilot that if he had to crash, that he would deliberate on choosing who would survive because they did not want a woman on that plane. They did not want my children because we would be major obstacles if something happened. We would threaten everybody on that plane. I didn't see myself as a threat, but that's the way the logistics of flying in the winter look at you. And so again, that's the power of 
the wind, the power of um, nature, and the power of your spirit, because you, it's, it's easy to lose your spirit sometimes when you're encountering things that, over which you have absolutely no control, and you can lose your spirit. And, and the, being able to retain your spirit and sit around two months later and tell the stories and laugh. <laughs> it took a while before you could do that, especially the laughter. Or look at my two little girls and think, you know, what made me think I needed to take them on that plane anyways? They could have gone two months later and gotten the same shots, seen the same dentist. I didn't really have to do it at that time, but somehow I felt I had to do it. And it was the spirit, it was the power of wind, and that has affected my own personal theology. When I look at the world and I see creation and I um, look at my children now, my great-grandchildren, and think of the power of the world that they have been born into is um, pretty amazing. So my view of wind and nature is very different, a very different view. I am not a scientist. I have not studied it other than in, you know, baby science courses when I was in college. Um, what, in Massachusetts, in a small liberal arts women's college that really was separated from the harshness and the dimensions of the power. So, so that, that has, really affected my whole vision of my world, of my family, and it's also made me appreciate being part of a tradition where so much of our music in the church speaks of spirit and wind and, you know, wind, wind, blow on me. Do I really mean that? And I mean, I can remember some winds that I didn't want to blow on me. Or, so, you know, it's just given a whole different dimension. And um, so my reading of wind and power is very different than a scientist. Mine is more of a poet, perhaps, or um, a survivor. You know, I think of the things that I survived in, um, not just in Alaska, in Wyoming. I've been hiking and out caught. We, I've been in a car in a storm that if, if that wind had blown the car off the highway, which it certainly felt like it could do, my life would have a different ending. <laughs> I wouldn't be here to tell you these ramblings of mine about the spirit. But my, some of my favorite hymns, and when Jim plays them on the organ, and they, you know, come out, it's just miraculous. I mean, it affects my soul. And um, they are some of the strongest in my mind, hymns in the hymn book. I mean, I'm surprised the hymn book can hold those hymns. You know, why haven't they blown away? Why aren't they in the Titsi or somewhere? How could they still be here? And so that's my reading of the power of spirit, which I think of as the power of wind and the, the gift the perception that that gives us not just um, not just H2O, you know, 
hydrogen and oxygen doing its thing. That's pretty amazing. But there's so much more bigger um, and scary and strengthening. So I guess that's my comments about wind and its place in my creation story. My story is different than anybody else's here, but that's where I am. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. question about, um, I loved what Connie was saying about how humans for so long have understood wind and air as both life-giving and destructive. And you talked about that in your stories. Um, and so we take that and we wrap it into those experiences and wrap them into our um, sense of who God is and who we are in God and our spirituality. And I'm just wondering now, in the years since, say, the 1970s, when the EPA did all that, like, realizing that now air can threaten us and give us life in a whole new way, in ways because humans have changed the composition of air. And I'm just wondering kind of what, the, what, what a spirituality of a post-pollution age looks like in terms of understanding the Holy Spirit, are there new metaphors? Um, are there new kinds of experiences we might have? Um, I'm trying to think about the prayer that you have with a HEPA filter, for example. Keep clean, clean air uh, in your lungs. But I'm just curious, um, Connie, if you have, any thought, have had any thoughts about the Holy Spirit in air in terms of uh, pollutions or bad air, bad air um, all summer long, um, and if the two of you have thought in your studies about how you think about these things you are learning biologically in a spiritual sense. Well, I think that um, certainly the, whatever you learn as you are learning, and I think we learn until we die. I certainly hope I do. And so I'm looking forward to what are the new things I may learn um, tomorrow or in 10 years. Um, if my mind, I'll be 95 then, what, what will I be learning at that point? But it is, um, there's, there's so many things to learn, and I think that each thing you learn adds to the dimension of what you are learning about. So you don't toss out something because you learn something new. In my mind, you add to what you knew about spirit and wind, you add to it so it becomes bigger. It becomes more complex sometimes. Um, and sometimes you toss some stuff out. And that makes as much change as if you bring new stuff in. So 
Yeah, I definitely would say that if, if you're alive and aware that you're alive, you're changing every day. And your perception of, of the power, I mean, the immense power in wind is just scary, overwhelming for me. When, you know, when I've been out in the, in the, on, in the mountains and you hear that wind and you hear the trees cracking and you hear branches creaking and um, there's no way to avoid the power that is around you. Power is, in my mind, scary. But it's also something that our world has and must have. I mean, we need the currents changing. We need the air changing. We need, you know, if you're a sailor, you certainly need those winds moving you. If you're an outfitter in the mountains, you, the wind is going to tell you something about where the elk might be or whatever. So we need those things, but they, um, they're they easy to overlook. I think it's very easy to overlook things um, that are so close to you. spirituality in my studies, it's hard to not think of us like a Christian and a scientist, I guess, to me at least. Uh, like for example, Sydney mentioned that I study moss. That was my sort of primary target of my undergraduate studies. Um, and the a fun thing about moss is that Sydney alluded to is that mosses actually can filter air disproportionately to their size. And so when you look at like these very small organisms, and you think about how they are part of such a larger, more grand scale than themselves, and they add to that way more than the sum of what they are. I think there's a certain holiness in that and a certain majesty that I feel when I think about that, and things like that, just in general. Yeah, I, I find my work very spiritual, and it's post-pollution world, you know, we're, we're facing new challenges when it comes to pollution, but I'm also reminded of uh, sort of classical stories of Vesuvius and how we've always been, in, in the lepers in the Bible, we've always been facing narratives of pollution um, as human society, even though we have new names for them now, because we are looking at them in, in different and potentially more objective ways, different names for them, different cycles. Um, but in many ways, living out some of the same stories in reimagined ways. Thank you. Also, just to add, uh, Michael's a double major too, I think. Oh, yeah. I also majored in theater, but I don't usually mention oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> just for the interest. Say that, like, large amounts of ash sitting on top of oh. certain plants. <laughs> like, 
for sure. At some point, it's not so much air pollution if you think of it as like aerosol, right? So like invisible microscopic pollutants and just like airborne debris in certain sense. If that doesn't get washed off, like kind of can hinder some plants. Um, yeah, and then there are also different. So when you have large amounts of dust or ash blown about in the atmosphere, not that it directly impacts the plants by sitting on them necessarily, because like fires are part of ecology. Um, but when you have like new dust, it's like limestone dust in an acidic environment or acidic dust in a like formerly basic environment, right? They can change the pH of the soil, which can change your mm -hmm. composition. So if you've got unprecedented amounts of ash, like moving around in an ecosystem that can add to fertility in some senses because ash is nutrient rich, but also change the pH, which selects for different plants. And while some plants might survive, it could change the historic composition of the ecosystem. Well, I'm always amazed that with plants, different part of your house, they'll grow better or worse, different parts outside. You know, it just always amazed me how nature, how you know, God did all this stuff and how everything works. And ever since I've been little, my favorite things are art and math. And to me, that's kind of what this is. And so when they say, you know, science here and math here, uh, I mean, science here and art here, or science and, you know, uh, spiritual stuff, I just find them intermixed. I don't know how you all think, but I just can see it on both sides. I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> As you were talking about um, wind and power, I'm thinking about wind power and how <laughs> 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 Ha <laughs> ha! 
Well, do you all have anything else to say? Have you thought when you were listening to one another, ah, oh, that was something I want, want to be able to comment on? Since Sydney and Connie actually got to speak, but they didn't get to sort of speak back and forth, and Michael didn't get to speak at all, what, what inspired you tonight in what you've heard? <laughs> And it was funny because he was talking about how, is, is, is it possible to reclaim that sense in conspire of breathing together rather than the sense of conspiracy as we often think of it negatively. But what is it like if we're as a community are breathing together or being inspired together? Yeah, and it's so important to know the roots of words in my mind. How much it adds to know those roots. You know, I'm sitting here looking at the wind checks oh, yeah. of an amazing instrument that does is controlled. It's because it's controlled. The wind is very carefully tightly controlled in those pipes and things. Jim knows how to let it out. And when he lets it out, watch out, because you know, the, the building can sometimes... There are so many ways in which we know wind and know power. And um, very few people know how to make that happen. That's a real specialty. It's like musical respiration. Oh, and from here, it's just beautiful to look back and look at it, even without hearing it. But the fact that I have heard it so often and love it. You know, sometimes when he does something, you can feel the really? cues are, are going, which there were some people who didn't always appreciate that. <laughs> There was one person who was very important to me. I mean, I was married to him for 62 years, and Jim couldn't make it go strong enough, you know, more, 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 more. Um, and it's, it's just amazing. That just really says to me, you talk about art and science, spirit and science. That's what that is. I mean, it's just working together and adjusting and stuff. Something that I've been thinking about after hearing everybody speak is how interconnected we all are through the medium of air, I suppose. Like the air that I breathe and even use to sing and make music and whatnot is 
the same air that you all breathe? Is the same mm -hmm. air that is breathed in by animals? Is the air that is produced by plants and other organisms? And in that way, we are always very interconnected. And like in forest fires, the suffering of plants becomes my suffering as well because I breathe in the pollutants. You know. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And I keep thinking of the stratospheres and stuff. I don't remember that they didn't, you know, interact at all. I thought the science was very interesting. <laughs> and what we can do, you know, to help. I guess I forgot a key phrase from my talk, and that's the tragedy of the commons. If you've ever studied conservation, you'll know this. It's based on a story from, you know, medieval Europe where people would have common land to graze their livestock and because no one was particularly in charge of caring for the land, right? It was always the most degraded land because everyone got to benefit from it, but no one was actually in charge of caring for it. Right. So we now call common resources like water. No one has particular jurisdiction or responsibility. Uh, responsibility. Yeah. I. Yeah, I have a background of jurisdiction and, and law, but also yeah, just general responsibility for it. Um, but also trying to spin a new narrative where it's not just tragedy but epic. To resolve the tragedy. Thank you all.